This is such an exciting episode where we get to hear from Preston Tharp, a former Navy officer and now an MBA graduate who's headed to BCG. Preston started with absolutely no exposure to the consulting industry, but when he got into the MBA process, he discovered Management Consulted, BCG, and the entire interesting cottage industry of consulting. Find out how he went from his military background through his MBA to BCG and how he got a return offer to go back. This really interesting session is one of our favorites. We hope you enjoy it. We first met Preston uh, through a relationship that we have with the Olin School of Business at Wash U in St. Louis. And uh, Preston was a uh, a first year, and can I say, uh, with a lot of leadership experience, but lacking in consulting slash business knowledge and experience. <laughs> and so Preston put himself tenderly into our hands to help him train for the interview process. And we got a really great look at a really fantastic person that we knew the firms would like. And so we had our work cut out for us on the tactical side, but on the personal side, it was a slam dunk. So Preston, we're really excited to have you. And uh, why don't we just get started by hearing a little bit about who you are, where you came from, and take us all the way up to deciding to go to business school. Then we'll go from there with a few deeper questions. Sounds good. So um, I took a fairly non-traditional route um, from high school to the MBA program in that I joined the Navy directly out of high school. Uh, I did not go to college first, so I joined the Navy as an enlisted person. Um, and I spent nine years in the Navy working on nuclear submarines and the nuclear power program. And I really enjoyed it, but I got to a point where everything started to be the same thing. Once you're on a second submarine doing the exact same job, things start to get a little stale, including the recirculated air. Um, <laughs> so I decided to leave the Navy and take a career transition, which um, any shift from the military to civilian world is a transition anyway. Uh, I did my undergrad while I was in the Navy, um, got a nuclear engineering technology degree while um, taking online classes while still working full time and decided that I wanted to use the GI Bill and go back to school and started looking at degree programs and figuring out what I really wanted to do. Uh, looking at the business world, I thought I could do stuff in business and work in any industry, anywhere I want to be and just really get a lot of variety in my life. And uh, I'd always been interested in economics at kind of a novice level. Um, but wasn't really a huge fan of math, even though I have an engineering degree. Um, so I thought, you know, business would be a little bit lighter math, more logical thinking and strategy. So let's go business. Started looking at MBA programs and everything I learned about MBAs was it's a career pivot anyway. So I figured it was a great time to pair that up with my time leaving the Navy. And that's what brought me to the MBA program and specifically Olin. Awesome. Great. So now I want to hear a little bit about why you chose Olin from a military background in particular. Mm -hmm. What was it about the school that felt like a great fit? Was there somebody that influenced you or something that got you excited about going there? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, one of the biggest reasons I went to Olin was just the, the Veterans Association, you know, the Veterans Support Club there at Olin was just such a strong club. And I even had someone from the club reach out to me. I didn't reach out and ask them as soon as I got accepted at Olin, they re called, reached out to me, talked to me on the phone for an hour, just explaining all the different things that the Veterans Club did, all the different um, support structures that were there. And I really felt like that was a place I would be really comfortable and feel supported in that, you know, the, the shift from military to civilian life is always a struggle and having some people who have doing the similar thing at the same time and having that support structure was really important to me. And knowing that the school cared about their veterans was also something that I was really passionate about. So I just knew after talking to, uh, his name was Ryan Harbison. Um, after talking to Ryan, I realized that that's where I'm gonna fit. And it was an amazing experience and it definitely was a great fit. Amazing, okay. So now we're gonna fast forward and then we're gonna backtrack. So Sounds you good. just completed your MBA at Olin, and congratulations on your graduation, you. by the way. So you're going to BCG. Yes. What would you say was the most valuable thing that you learned at Olin, whether it applies to BCG or not? Mm -hmm. um, I think, say, the most valuable thing was that 
you're always going to experience problems and very often they're going to be people problems, no matter what you're working on, uh, whether it's, I did a lot of experiential learning classes where we did kind of student consulting projects and it might be your faculty advisor, a member on the team, it could be the client. Um, there's always going to be something unforeseen come up and those soft skills, those abilities to deal with issues and arguments, not arguments, but conflicts at a low level and kind of find that best fits all situation. Um, I thought that was just something that I saw a lot in the military because it's a very conflict oriented bunch. Um, but it really is all across the business world and spectrum. That was a, a big surprise for me and learning a lot of skills on how to manage conflict uh, specifically in the business world was probably the most important thing that I think is going to help me in consulting and through the rest of my life. I do not disagree. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. So then I have another question for you related back to pre MBA or during your MBA, whenever it happened, it's not normal for people that are in the military to hear about or know about consulting. It's not a standard exit pathway that a lot of people pursue or know about. And I'm curious if you knew about consulting or had an interest in it while you were still in the military and before you started your MBA, or if it was something that was introduced to you through programming at Bullitt. Mm -hmm. So it was actually while I was working on MBA applications, um, most schools wanted to know what your post MBA goal was and what career you wanted to get into. Um, and I had no idea. So I started looking at a bunch of different jobs and industries and types of roles. Uh, and I found consulting and the more I learned about it, the more it sounded like something I'd really like to get into. Um, one of the things that led me to leave the Navy was I started to get, for lack of a better term, a little bored with the, doing the same job over and over again. And consulting was one of those industries where I could do a job in an industry for eight weeks and then completely shift industries and do something else and still be able to work on those difficult, challenging problems and work with, you know, the smart smartest, best people in the industry, you know, consulting teams are brilliant people who are really smart and people that I know I would learn from rather than being the smartest person in the room, um, which I don't know has ever happened in my life, but <laughs> no. um, and so working on the, the applications for the MBA program led me to learn about consulting and it just kind of turned into the dream job I never knew I wanted. Amazing. Well, let's talk a little bit about networking, the first step in the process. Okay. How did you use networking, either in your favor or not use it, in order to get some of the opportunities that you had from an interview perspective? Yeah, that's perfect. Um, so ironically, I didn't network at all with anyone at BCG. Um, I just happened to have the right profile or have a, an advocate inside that liked my profile. Um, so that's not the right answer, but I got lucky, I guess. Um, but with a lot of the other firms, I networked and got a really good feel for the people working there and um, just not just culture at the firm, but within the specific office I was interviewing with, um, especially with alumni at the school were the best uh, step in the door, people that were willing to talk to other Olin students. And then from there, meet other people through them that they were willing to introduce me to. And so the most important um, event that happened that was directly a result of networking was I had a conflict with two firms interviews on the same day. The re recruiting lead wasn't willing to give me a different alternate date. They were only interviewing on one day, but because I had talked to a, enough different people at the firm and impressed them, they were willing to advocate for me to get me the interview. Uh, it was a firm I ended up not taking a job with, but uh, had I not done that networking, I wouldn't have even had that first interview. So, Okay, awesome. And when you say networking, what do you mean? Cold emailing, chatting with people that were already coming through channels? What were your tactical pieces of that process? Yeah, I think the, the thing I was most comfortable with, and I think personally believe that makes the most um, impact is talking to people that you've already bumped into. So people that were coming to the school through other channels, uh, just being able to introduce myself and have a quick two or three minute chat with them to get that FaceTime and then follow up with an email later. Say, hey, we met here. I'd like to get a little bit more insight from you, talk to you for another 15 minutes. And then just really 
come prepared with some questions, but not just stick to the questions and try and get a little bit more rich conversation and really kind of connect on that personal level so that they were willing to talk to me later or advocate for me. And sometimes personal stories are the connections that make them think of someone else that you should talk to. Um, so. Amazing. So a lot of people often ask how long you prepared for the case interview and how you began your prep process, because mm -hmm. that's where some people are mid process and people are never going to go through the process. And some people are at the very early stages of the process. So for you, when was that? And what did you do at the beginning of the case interview prep process? Absolutely. So the uh, first step for me was probably before the MBA program even started, I learned, hey, there's this thing called a case interview that I should probably know about and started trying to find as many free resources as I could and just reading as much as I could to try and understand it. There's a lot of great free resources on YouTube or other places on the internet. <clears throat> Most of them eventually led me to, hey, you should read one of these three very well-known case books. So I bought a couple two of those case books and read through them. And that was kind of the beginning of my case prep. Um, <clears throat> from there, I think actually the free case of the month is what first introduced me to management consulted. Um, and I would log back in every month to look at that free case until I actually started the program and got really uh, started the MBA at Olin and really got into the case prep. And that's when I um, got access to all the resources and paid for the coaching and got really involved and really got to know management consulted. So again, I'm going to jump to the end of the process and then I'll move back one more time. <laughs> so now after having gotten the offer at BCG and having started at BCG, uh, what would you do differently at the beginning of your prep process? Uh, so there's two things at the beginning that I wish I had done differently. One is just getting started sooner. And I don't mean looking at resources, but actually doing my first live interview. Um, I really like to have all the information up front, and that's a habit I'm trying to break both for business school and consulting later on. But I felt like I, if I was as ready as possible when I did my first live interview, it would go a lot better, but really not the case. Your first one is almost always just going to fall apart, not necessarily fall apart, but you're going to do worse than you expect. Um, and you learn a lot about yourself and where you need to focus in that first practice. So. If I had just done my first live case a month earlier, that month would have been a lot better, more focused practice for me. And the second thing was using my resources a little bit better in that I paid for um, some live coaching with Management Consulted and had some resources at the school, some peer coaches that I didn't want to start using until I was towards the end of my process. And my thought process was I want to get as good as possible so I can really get as much out of them or out of those resources when I'm later and I just need the polish. But what I found was having that expert opinion taught me some of the basic things that I could do better at and really helped me develop a better study plan. So I wish I had started with those resources earlier, started, you know, in the first couple of weeks, do that first live case with one of the coaches at management consulted and learn, Hey, here's a good study path. Um, because a personalized study path that someone who has been there and done that gives you and helps you develop, it's going to be way better than what you come up with on your own, having never done the process. I didn't know that about your process. I think it's very enlightening, but I'm not surprised because mm -hmm. I think by nature we are tender toward getting constructive feedback. So we want to minimize it, right? We want the least mm -hmm. constructive feedback that we'll get. And what we need to actually change the mindset there to be faster in the overall mm -hmm. process. But it's hard. It's, it's admittedly very hard. It's definitely Great. hard. So you did a lot of things right. Now we're back to the middle of the process. What did you do that led to your success, specifically at UCT? So the most important thing for me with the case prep was to do quality practice over quantity. And that was not just doing focused live cases, not just using the best resources, but really trying to understand where my weak areas were and what I needed the most work on, which turns out was, you know, the business language, really being able to talk through business concepts and the math, um, being able to do that really quick mental math, I think was the thing that I struggled with the most. So identifying that early on coming up with a, a strategy for prep that worked for me, which was just daily doing an hour's worth of math practice just to 
kind of develop that skill and then doing cases with a goal in mind. So I would target a math heavy case or target a case that had a lot of graphs or charts if that was the thing I was focusing on that week. Um, and really being able to do targeted practice to work on my weak areas rather than just trying to do as many cases as possible and end up doing 10 cases that didn't help me where I needed to work. That was kind of the main focus. Do you know what your case number ended up being? Did you keep track of them? <laughs> yeah, I think I was at uh, 42 when I did my first first round interview and about somewhere in the mid 60s by the time I finished all of my including interviews. the ones you did in case in, in interviews those yep, count. I, yeah those absolutely count because you learn a lot about yourself when you're actually under the stress of the interview and that's you figuring oh wow i really probably should know a little bit more about the hotel industry or whatever industry you did that interview in you know it's never the one that you think that's the only rule no. <laughs> if you think it's hotels it's not hotels yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, awesome. So just to wrap up the chat about the interview prep, then I want to get on to a few more final personal questions. I, I'm interested in understanding your advice. I know that in your second year, you became an advisor to a number of peers and students that were going through the process. And I don't know if they listened to you, but still, your advice was good. So what was your <laughs> advice to them? Three okay. tips in particular. Come on, let's be consulting life. Three, three tips. Three tips, yes. Okay. Yeah. So, see, the first is don't be afraid to start. Um, much like the mistakes I made, really get into that live case, that first practice case, as early as possible because that's when you're going to learn what you need to work on. Second tip is don't get overwhelmed in resources. There are a lot of resources out there. There are a lot of different structures. You don't need to memorize them all. Find the set of structures that really works for you. Memorize those and then eventually get to the point where you never use them again. You need to have custom structures later on. Um, <clears throat> and the third piece of advice is that targeted practice. Um, using quality time and quality focus to really work on the things you need to work on. And part of that is working with your classmates and giving the cases that you think you need to work on because it's going to allow you to see how other people think and work through it. And you might learn, I mean, some of the best things I learned in case was just watching my classmates do something. I was like, oh, I've never even thought of approaching a problem that way. I'm going to remember that. Um, so yeah, that quality over quantity for sure. We'll be right back after this quick break. Have you ever heard a new digital trend and thought to yourself, okay, does this really matter? Asking the right questions helps you cut through the noise and get down to what matters most. I'm Jim Hertzfeld, host of the What If So What podcast, where we discover what's possible with digital and figure out how to make it real by asking what if, so what, and most importantly, now what? Subscribe and listen, and together we can turn big ideas into tangible actions so you can get shit done. Great. So now let's talk about next steps. You went to BCG for the summer. What was one thing that was better than you expected when you were at BCG? Oh, man. Um, I, everything. Um, so coming from the military in a place where uh, personal comfort was not a priority, uh, I was very surprised and impressed with how many people cared about my, you know, mental well-being and personal well-being and just the fact that I was enjoying the experience. Part of that is because they want the interns to be really happy and want to come back. But the other one was it felt like my managers genuinely cared whether or not I was getting a good experience and was going to be able to come back the next week and be able to put in the same amount of work. Uh, and I can think to a specific incident, I was feeling under the weather and had a head cold and Every time throughout the rest of my life that I've had a head cold, I just suffer through it and keep going to work. And we were in the case team room and I was sniffling a little bit and, you know, coughing up, <clears throat> coughing a bit. And I had tissues next to me and consultants in the room were like, do you not feel well? You should go back to the hotel if you're not feeling well. I was like, I'm fine. I could work through it. And then about five minutes later, the manager's like, no, you're going back to the hotel. You're going to spend the day there and rest. Like you don't need to be here. You can work from the hotel. And it was just like, I was, they were almost like forceful with being nice and making sure I was taken care of. And that was just uh, something I had never experienced before. So definitely a very pleasant experience. Love that. 
So you're, I don't want to give away the secret, but you're going back. <laughs> so I'm going to give it away. Uh, what led to them giving you an offer? What led to you accepting that offer? Yep. Um, I think a lot of the things that led to the offer were just me being very intentional about getting feedback and working on the things that I got feedback with to the point where I would specifically schedule meetings on with consultants like in my team, little 15 minute sessions on, hey, I'm not very good at writing agendas for my slides. Can we sit down and talk through like why it's important and how to do better at it? To the point where I asked so many questions during the day that I think my team was actually starting to get a little annoyed with how many questions I asked, but they always answered them. Um, <clears throat> I think just trying to use the feedback as constructively as possible and just show improvement. And so from week one to week 10, I had a very big improvement in slide building, model building, and just being able to communicate with people in ways that allowed me to iterate faster. I think a lot of that went towards the offer at the end of the day they don't tell you exactly why they gave you an offer but i think uh, i was a good fit for the team and was willing to show improvement so i think in my opinion that's why it worked out well and the reason i accepted the offer was a little bit of how you know a little bit of what i was talking about earlier it was just one of the best work experiences i've ever had uh, i even in 10 weeks i felt like i belonged there i was part of the team i liked everybody i worked with uh, really enjoyed just like that that diverse people i had the opportunity to work alongside. And uh, I just knew probably around like week four of the internship, I was like, if nothing goes wrong and they give me an offer, I will come back and just because I enjoyed it so much. So how long did it take you to accept your offer, Preston? Uh, I didn't actually stand up from the desk with the partner that gave me the offer. He explained to me how long I had to sign the offer. And I was like, so who do I give it to after I sign it? And he said, well, you can just sign it right now and give it to me. And that's what happened. So... No negotiating or anything, just signed. On Best the spot. case scenario for all involved. Yep. <laughs> Amazing. Well, obviously, lots changed since you signed the offer last mm -hmm. August. And so here we are almost a year later. And so tell us a little bit about what you're planning to use your time between graduation and when you start to do. Yep. So uh, my original plan was to travel abroad for a few months. Uh, my start date is in January. I actually, asked for the January start date so I would have time to travel. Now, given what's going on in the world, traveling internationally is not the most viable option. So right now I'm actually planning a trip to spend July and August traveling around national parks as long as they're open uh, west of the Mississippi because I haven't really spent much time out there. So still in the planning phases, but that's the, the current plan. And then come back and um, probably late fall and early winter try and start uh, reacquainting myself with some of the skills that I will have forgotten during the very relaxing vacation I plan and uh, you know, really honing in on those consulting skills that I think I'm going to need. Didn't you just spend the last two years west of the Mississippi? Hmm. Yeah, but I spent all my time pretty much at school or in my apartment studying, so <clears throat> didn't really do much exploring. Five miles, five miles west of the Mississippi doesn't count, huh? Yeah, just like just barely west of the Mississippi, but yeah. yeah absolutely. <laughs> Okay, good. Well, I have a few final questions for you. Uh, number one, you chose the Philadelphia office and mm -hmm. office selection is such a big part that's often underrepresented in people's understanding of the consulting process. How did you choose the Philly office? Yep. So one of the things that I thought right from the start was I would much rather be a consultant anywhere rather than pick a place I want to go. Um, and I called it like being geographically flexible. I made sure to even put that in the application. I'd rather be a consultant in a city I don't want to live in than having a job I wasn't looking for. Um, but every firm wanted you to pick an office, even though I wasn't really sure. And uh, after nine years in the Navy and two years of an MBA program, I hadn't been close to home in 11 years. And I've always liked Philadelphia. So I put down Philadelphia because I'll be close to family. My entire family's in Pennsylvania. Um, and it actually works really well. I love Philadelphia and I'm very happy to go back, but mostly it was just to be closer to my family. And did you need then to specifically network with folks in the Philadelphia office? Did that end up being important at least later on in the process or was it just an easy pass for you? Yeah, I think um, 
I got lucky in that one of the people involved in selecting resumes is also a Navy veteran. Um, and then after I had the first interview, I did our uh, actually, I got invited to the interview and the recruiter put me in touch with one of the other Navy veterans in the office. And through him, I met a few other people and did some networking between getting the interview invite and the interview. And that was helpful in having a little bit more context and being able to use that BCG specific language. Um, but beyond that, not really a whole lot of networking to get the interview. Now, you mentioned a little bit about honing skills before you dive in to BCG and you have an unfair advantage in a good way because you know what you need to know more than you did started last year. Uh, but can you be really specific about that? What skills and what are you going to do to hone them? Yep. So one of my weaknesses that I still needed a lot of improvement on when I left my internship was in slide building. And so that's one of the things I focused on in my MBA program, just kind of helping everyone I could try and get their slides a little bit prettier and more to the point. Um, and one of the best piece of pieces of advice I got from someone during my internship and something I plan to do later is find some slides that look really good and then try to build them from blank in PowerPoint. So here's what it should look like. And I'm going to try and build this without any shortcuts and just try and make them pretty on my own and just be able to, you know, quickly build a slide. And that was a great piece of advice. So I'm going to do a little bit of that practice. Um, again, mentioned the math, uh, even though I'm not going into interviews, it's still important to have. And it actually surprised me how often we used quick mental calculations in the case team, meet, case team room and in meetings with the client. And finally, uh, I learned the very, very basics of Tableau during my internship. Um, and I've been spending the last year of my MBA program and continue to spend and plan to continue spending the next few months just trying to learn as many functions in Tableau as I can because it was very impressive what could be done and I know I'll have the opportunity and the probably need to be able to use it once I start full time. Awesome. Okay, well thank you for that. I have a few final rapid fire personal questions. So these are short questions, short answers and then we'll wrap <laughs> it up. The first one is tell us about a professor who inspired you. Yeah, so an, an economics professor that was one of our core professors, his name is John Horn. Um, it wasn't necessarily that first class, but he did a lot of, to help the student consulting teams. And he was just super inspiring that he always had some level of expertise on something and was always able to give you really good advice. Turns out he was a former McKinsey consultant, so he had a lot of experience in that. But just his ability to get five minutes of background and just give you some really good advice that was um, really inspiring to me and uh, try to formulate my advice to people very similarly to the way he gave advice to us just because I know it was always really helpful and straight and to the point. Amazing. Second question, the first place that you plan to travel post COVID. Ooh, whenever. So whenever, whenever you travel or mid COVID, I guess, but you yeah. know, you know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. so, somewhere in there. Uh, so right now I'm looking at either Yellowstone or Grand Tetons as a national park. They're both opening up, I think, the end of this week for camping. So I think um, either that will be the destination, but I'm pretty sure I'll stop along the way once I have my route figured out. West. Yep. <laughs> Giddy up. Good. And then what about internationally? So when you are able to travel internationally, where will you go? So uh, my original plan was to do uh, six weeks of language immersion in Munich in the fall uh, and finish with Oktoberfest, but Oktoberfest has been canceled and I don't know that international travel is going to happen. So I'm not really sure. I've got a, a list of probably 10 countries that are my the next place I'll visit list. Um, so things of like either Machu Picchu in Peru or uh, diving in Thailand or <clears throat> I think it's just going to have to be where the mood takes me once I finally plan that trip. Sounds wonderful. <laughs> awesome. Okay. Third and final question. Philly cheesesteaks. There are generally two big dogs on the street and then there's all of the boutique options. Which one, if you could only take somebody to one in Philly, where do you take them and why? Huh. So it's got to be just uh, either one of the boutique shops or even just, at another random restaurant that has cheesesteaks. Um, 
I haven't tried any of the two. I haven't tried Pats or Geno's, the two big ones. Um, but the general consensus I've gotten from everyone that's been in Philly for more than a month is they're both overrated and everyone makes a good cheesesteak. So I'd rather just grab a cheese stick that I could kind of customize on my own. And everyone, almost every place you go in Philly has a good cheese steak. So that might be the wrong answer, but it's the one I like. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you, Preston. Thank you so much. It's great to, to hear about your journey. Thank you for listening to this episode on how to break into BCG, hosted by Management Consulted and Preston Tharp. Preston is a former client of Management Consulted, and if you'd like to do what Preston did, break into BCG, especially from a non-traditional background, we would love to help. Through our interview coaching process and our very curated personal style, we not only have clients, but also clients that become friends. And we're excited to advocate for you in your process. You can reach out to us at team at managementconsulted.com. If you'd like more content just like this one, please subscribe to our channel and make sure that you share it on all of your social media channels. Thanks again for listening.